Hello, it's Jim Powers with a Hobie Island Coastal Sailing Zoom event held in February of 2021. Uh, just a brief introduction, we have a handful of interested Hobie Island sailors. We started off with some definitions around coastal sailing primarily. We also explored a number of ideas around how to improve the island catamarans. You see them listed here. Uh, next, we're going to jump right into the audio and the uh, captured Zoom event. Uh, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Dirk, how do you pronounce it? Yes. So where are you from, Dirk? Ventura, California. All right. And this is Jim, your host, and I'm uh, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So uh, got a foot of snow on the ground, and uh, but still want to talk Hobies and some island sailing. So. I just got off a, a bike ride and it's about 75. I know that's me, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Well, we'll give it a minute here. And we have Chuck on the line also, hailing out of warm, sunny Florida. Yes. Where in Florida, Chuck? Uh, in the Naples area, we're actually on Chukaluski Island. Oh, nice. Everglades. I see a lot of um, uh, videos on the Hobie forums about uh, group uh, island uh, expeditions in the Everglades. Some of them yeah, it's little... beautiful. Yeah, it's a, that's one My of the wife best. and I were out this morning. And... Hmm? All right. Good. That's what I'd like to hear. All right, we're just going to give it a few minutes. We'll probably go to at least five after the top of the hour and um, for those that can join in. And then uh, we'll take it from there. So we'll see who else can make it. And this is our second Zoom session that we had like this. We had another one back in the summertime. And we had about uh, 12 or so people join in then. And I uh, don't really know how many people will come because we just put it out there as a public posting on the forum. So whoever can join. Your hobby, have your Hobie organizations been active during COVID at all? I know it's very, it varies from state to state. Yeah, we don't have a, a real, that I'm aware of anyway, an active Hobie group on an ongoing basis anyway uh, in, the, in the immediate area. Um, okay. And it's just by luck and by crook if we happen to meet up at some point. Um, but I'm kind of looking to change that. It's part of why I'm hosting these sessions, see if we can get some uh, folks to participate uh, locally. Um, there was, um, you know, I went through the forums and I found some old emails and just kind of Googled around a little bit. And I, uh, I got a, a, a contact back that says that they might have a regatta up in the Bay Area, um, just north of San Francisco, in, as early as May. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot more fun to do this stuff uh, in a group. Yeah. And a lot safer, too. Yeah, that's the, the safe thing. I, uh, I, I have my old man bucket list started with, uh, I, I want next July or August, I want to uh, uh, kayak out to... Uh, uh, Santa Cruz Island. It's about 20 miles. And I, I think it's doable if I. Uh, oh, yeah, that's doable. And, and uh, you know, exercise a little bit and maybe get some, get a, get a day with decent winds. But that's the, you know, the, the days are long and the, uh, you know, the weather's good, you know. So I figured I'd go out there and camp one or two nights and then head back. Yeah, that sounds totally doable. I think so. Yeah, I just need a little. Uh, um, I got a guy that actually sails uh, just regular sailboats, and he, he said if I can't find another island guy, he'll uh, he'll follow me around and keep me in general sight. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough, I guess. <laughs> just in case I get you know bumped up by a shark or something. Yeah. All right. Well, so far it's just the three of us, but we'll give it a few more minutes. Um, yeah, normally I sail solo just because I can't find anybody else, I guess, maybe crazy enough to go out sailing, uh, but it's mostly solo. And I typically do 
20, 30, 40 miles a day, you know, um, and they're almost all loops. So come back to the same place I launched from. Um, uh, but uh, Is yeah. that mostly around, around Philly or do you go up and down the coast a little bit or? Up and down the coast, I'd say it's mostly around the mid-Atlantic area, Atlantic Ocean, Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, uh, Delaware River, uh, up around New York Harbor, New York City, Harbor, you know, uh, Hudson, East River, um, you know, around Statue of Liberty, up in that area. And then uh, I got it on a trailer, so I run it, I go down to Florida every year for about a month or so and uh, kick around uh, 10,000 islands down there in uh, nice. Marple Island. Um, uh, they have the Everglades Challenge. I kind of met up with some of those guys last year while I wasn't in the challenge itself. Uh, and we're actually trying to get a uh, trying to get a similar type event organized around the Chesapeake Bay. So you might have seen a posting on that. Uh, we're going to see if there's enough interest to do, uh, you know, Annapolis to Norfolk or back or something like that. You know, a couple hundred mile run over oh, that'd be nice. over several several days. So uh, anyway, uh, we'll still hold on here for just a couple more minutes. And I'll just check the email here and see if anybody's having trouble getting in. And if not, we'll just I go just, to the small uh, group. I just downloaded Zoom on uh, this Chromebook, and uh, it's still, it still it came up pretty quickly. So, yeah. All right. So why don't we uh, just give it a couple more minutes? And then we'll jump into the introductions. It's 5.02, my clock here. So we'll see. Uh, and and uh, Chuck, you have your island nearby? I don't know if you can hear us or not. It might have froze. But anyway, I, I was, I have my island. I, I do. We were out this morning and we got a couple reds and some uh, trout. All right, a little fishing going on. Good. All right, we have, uh, looks like Damien joining us. Let's give him a minute. Morning all, or I should say good evening for those over in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, and uh, welcome Damien. I remember from last time, I believe you're in Australia somewhere. Yeah, correct, in Sydney. All right, that's right, Sydney. Well, welcome. We have Chuck on the line here from Florida, and we have Dirk on the line from, uh, I think he said Ventura, California, if I remember correctly. Yes. And uh, we're waiting for a few more folks to join in. So we're just going to hold on for a minute here, uh, and then we'll get underway. And uh, one of the things we'll be doing at the beginning here is just doing a quick introductions and have each of you just kind of give us a uh, you know, your name, where you're located, a little bit about your experience with the islands uh, or otherwise, and, uh, and any kind of things you'd like to ask. Uh, and especially if you're going to want to present something, just maybe mention that in the introductions, and then uh, we can just account for it in the agenda. So, and then just as a reminder, we are recording this. So for the folks that can't make it uh, in person, uh, you know, they can watch it on YouTube later, you know, I'll probably put it up in, in a few days when I get some time to post a video. Um, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes and uh, we'll see if anyone else can join in. And uh, Damien, it looks like you got your video muted, which is fine. That's up to you if you want to display it or not. Um, what yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm just I'm just frantically cooking the kids' breakfast, and then I'll be fully <laughs> present after that. <laughs> that's that's important. Yeah. Um, and I am going to try and attempt to uh, connect a second time with my cell phone and just do a uh, a walk through around my island. Uh, it's sticking in my garage right now, so I got it kind of set up. I'll just do a little walk through and I'll explain some of the stuff I've done on it. And each of you are welcome to do the same if you have the ability. Um, and uh, if not, we can just uh, go through uh, with the various questions we have. So anyway, that's on the agenda. And while I continue to stall for time here, uh, let me just go over the agenda. So we'll start with some introductions. 
Uh, and then I thought, uh, you know, we had a, a meeting back in the summertime where we kind of talked about, uh, you know, got into some of the definitions about, you know, what is offshore sailing versus coastal sailing. We went around on that a little bit. We kind of settled on just about all the island stuff, even when you get down to quote offshore, it's more coastal. You're within, you know, 20 miles of the coast at best. Uh, there's not too many people I'm aware of that are doing, you know, going long distance out to sea uh, in an island. Um, so we kind of talked about coastal sailing. So we'll talk about some of the safety considerations, uh, what each of us might take just to ensure you stay safe while you're sailing. Uh, talk a little bit about any kind of modifications you might've made to the islands for coastal type sailing. Uh, and then we'll get into some a couple live walkarounds for those that want to do that. Um, and then we'll kind of just open it up for some questions around, uh, you know, what's work, what doesn't work. Talk a little bit about uh, maybe some electronics you might guys use for, you know, navigation or otherwise. So that's that's the agenda for today. Okay, so looks like it'll be a smaller group if no one else joins. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start just with the uh, the introductions, um, and. Uh, I'll kick it off first and you guys can follow behind. So again, my name is Jim Powers, located in the, um, Chester Springs. Uh, it's a Western suburbs of Philadelphia, kind of on the East Coast of the United States. Um, I've owned uh, Adventure Islands, currently own a Tandem Island. I've had uh, a Rev 11, Rev 13, an Outback uh, in my past. Uh, and I got, a, I just strictly only paddle Kona two-man um, kayak also currently. So I've been kayaking for many, many years, probably 30, 40 years, uh, and also been sailing for quite some time. And I really enjoy uh, getting on the water. And I try to sail once or twice a month year round. I was just doing a frostbite sail uh, in the Chesapeake Bay here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the water is kind of icy cold, uh, but uh, you still get some fun getting out uh, on the water. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, I'll say, Chuck, you want to introduce yourself next? Uh, Chuck Olson. Uh, presently, we're in our winter home in at 10,000 Islands. We're on Chukalaski, which is the west edge of Everglades National Park. And uh, we sail here all winter. And then we head back home, which is in Lake Superior, uh, which is the Apostle Islands National Lake Shore, Bayfield, the, in northern Wisconsin. And so we, we sail there and fish there as well. We probably fish more than we sail, but down here in Chukaloski, we do this both at the same time all winter. Works out real well. And then... We don't get as far as California, and certainly not Australia, but uh, our kids live out uh, adjacent to the Olympic National Park in Washington, and we do sail out there in the strait there uh, off the peninsula, Hood Canal and Puget Sound. So we, we have two OB anglers in the... Uh, trailer behind us and we have this Hobie Tandem Island which we've added a made a few adjustments that people have commonly done to fish and to travel a little bit further. All right good well thanks for that introduction and uh, how about Dirk you want to give us your brief background? Sure I, uh, I bought a, a used 07 uh, Adventure Island in September um, uh, my wife said, uh, let's go. And I said, well, I tell you what, let me go by myself the first time because I knew it was going to be a, a goat rope. Uh, and it was, but I, <laughs> I figured out how to do it. And then I took her out the next day. Um, she doesn't much care for uh, being out on those trampolines. So one of the things I want to check is I've seen people hook up spine boards, yep. you know, to um, be able to hike out and then also to uh, get up off the, the water a little bit more. 
And uh, out here, the water temp in Ventura is not as warm as you would think for California. It's uh, anywhere from about 52 degrees up to maybe 68. So we typically wear, you know, a shorty wetsuit. Seems to be enough for some booties. Uh, most days and uh, I'm just now now a couple of times like easing out past the breakwater and seeing uh you seeing how scared I can get before I have to come back <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got to watch out for those waves I can tell you from experience I, um, I understand that part <laughs> yeah I've uh well we'll get into some stories later but I've had a few uh rough goes with the surf but uh, yeah it's a lot of fun though too at the same time all right, uh, Damien, you want to give us your introduction? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm in Sydney, Australia, and I've been sailing uh, Hobie. I had a, I had a 2012 Tandem Island um, originally, which I had for maybe three or so years. And then uh, later I've now upgraded. So I've got a 2018 Tandem Island, and I really wanted to get the model with the vantage seats and and everything just so you're up a bit higher a bit more comfortable and everything so uh, i managed to pick up a second hand one of those which was still within my hobie warranty and the person who sold it sort of used it two or three times and uh elderly fellow and it just he had too many kayaks and things like that it wasn't for him to lug it around because it is a bit of a heavy beast at times and it um it came with a torpedo electric motor so uh, that's sort of wet my appetite a bit and given me a taste for uh, speed and comfort as well. So um, that's been really good. And I, I think like there's, I've got a very long list of like, things I'm wanting to do with the Hobie in terms of mods. Like I, I think one of my main goals is I really want to set it up for boat-based camping. So in Australia, there's just such beautiful areas you can go and visit and everything but a lot of like really protected you can't land on shore you can't even put a rope on a tree that's hanging over the water so uh, if you can sort of get into a sheltered bay and then uh, camp on the boat and anchor that would be an ultimate goal of mine um, and then as well to like mountain outboard harkers um, yeah I've, I've just recently got a um, dragonfly sonar slash like transducer style uh, fish finder gps thing um which i haven't yet mounted but i now need to consider uh how do i power that how do i what about navigational lights and anchoring lights and all this so it's sort of the hobie is getting <laughs> bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier but um <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's certainly a consideration of mine and, um, and I was glad you put that on the agenda about the electronics and stuff. And um, yeah, and I think like in terms of sort of coastal slash offshore sailing, there's like, like there's one particular island that's sort of like a, a big aspiration for a lot of people in, in New South Wales and Australia, which is called Broughton Island. It's only sort of maybe 5Ks offshore or whatever, but it's like it's got this beautiful... Uh, wooden deck on it and you are actually allowed to camp on there but it's like about a 20 kilometer sorry i'm talking in metric it's 20 kilometer sail to to get there so you definitely want all your equipment and your, your gear and if, if the weather turns while you're there you might be stuck for a few extra days so that's sort of <laughs> my one of my bucket list uh, goals to to do and then um and then after that when i've actually got a lot more confidence there's the uh, bass strait which you can sail from mainland Australia down to Tasmania, which is uh, like a, a multi-day, like couple of weeks sort of journey, hopping through different islands to get to uh, Tasmania. So that's, that's certainly also one of the dreams. <laughs> yeah, day that's by a, day. <laughs> no, that's an adventure. Yeah, that's a good, in the Southern Ocean too, you're getting pretty far south down there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that sounds exciting. Well, good, well, let's talk about it. And uh, we got another person who's joined us. Alessandro, uh, is that how you pronounce it? If you can introduce yourself, we're just going through introductions right now. And if you can just give us your name, where you're located, and uh, just a little bit about what type of sailing you do with the, with the Hobies. That's, that last question is very easy to, to answer. I do no sailing yet. Um, I joined, my name is Alejandro, very difficult to pronounce. Um, for English speakers, so uh, Alex is also fine. 
Um, I joined the previous meeting and I already um, informed you that I, I actually don't own a hobby yet, um, but I think I'm going to get one soon at Tandem Island. Uh, I was waiting for the new model to come and I don't know if you're aware, but uh, they are finally going to introduce on the, on the sticker, um, on the certification, the possibility to carry two adults and two children, which they hadn't before, plus uh, a more powerful uh, motor. I think it's 1,100 watts, um, which again is an upgrade. Um, and I was one of the people who were asking for this on the, on the forum and, and it's finally happened in Europe. It's even trickier because then we need to get the EU certification of conformity and that is also in place now. So all the different steps are there. And I hope that, uh, well, now with COVID, I don't know when they're going to be able to deliver new codes, but spring, summer, I don't know. At some point, I will finally own my dream Hobie Island. I've learned a lot from the forum, from, from you, from the previous um, Zoom event. I, I actually have doubts that at some point during the today's call, I, I'd like to share with you. And I just want to listen in and, and sure. continue learning. Cause I do, I would like to use it off offshore coastal sailing, sailing, I think is what we had agreed yeah. on. Yeah. The coastal, <laughs> the previous yeah. One. yeah. coastal sailing. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely something I, I want to do. I'm going to stop there for now. All right. Good. And where, where are you located today? Okay, um, in, in Switzerland. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm Spanish, um, but I'm located in Switzerland. I, yeah. I've, I've lived in the US. Uh, actually, I, um, your videos get me very excited because I, I did live in New York and I, I saw a recent video of yours, yeah. uh, Jim, sailing there. Amazing. Um, but now I'm, I'm in Switzerland. Yeah, well, welcome. And uh, thank you for the compliments. Thank you. And, uh, uh, I think we'll just jump right in then to the uh, to the agenda. We get everybody introduced, um, and let's jump right into the agenda. So the first thing was, <clears throat> and uh, just to talk about safety. You know, what type of things do you guys do uh, to keep yourself safe uh, when you're out in the water? Um, and I'll just kick it off. I do a lot of solo sailing. You know, I think the number one safety thing you can do is sail with a group of other people if you'd all can. Uh, that would really enhance the safety. But just uh, for me, I just find that I can't, there's not, just not that many people out that would want to go out at the same time that I do, whatever. So almost 99% of the time I'm sailing solo, uh, not by choice, just because that's what it is. So, uh, so sailing with someone else would be the uh, way, one way to improve safety. Uh, a good life jacket, uh, uh, VHS radio, uh, I do carry and also EPIRB, which is a personal emergency locator beacon, um, flashlights, you know, a knife, uh, normal stuff right on the right on the life jacket. So if I do fall overboard, I get all that with me. Uh, I don't use safety lines. I know some there's some discussion about do you clip yourself in to the Hobie if you fall over, you have a line you could get back on. I just don't do it. Uh, haven't really felt the need to do it. Um, and then on the boat safety lines, we'll go over some of this a little bit later, you know, in case of a capsize, I put ropes on each of the amas. So I have something I can, uh, write the, uh, tandem mile. And if it does capsize, they're very hard to capsize, uh, almost impossible, but occasionally it happens. And, uh, I have done it once and I would have appreciated having some lines. I could have just pulled, you know, uh, to help write the, write the, tandem island. So I've since rigged some of these things on the boat. Um, I also have lights on the boat. So I have port and starboard running lights, uh, a stern light, because uh, a lot of times I'll be coming back late and it'll be dark by the time I get back. So I put the running lights on. Uh, and I these are kind of like little battery operated um, uh, kayak lights that fail immediately when they get come into contact with salt water. So I kind of enclose them in plastic to try and uh, give them a little bit more life. And um, that works to some extent, um, but not as good as it really should. But uh, 
anyway, that's the kind of the, the short list for me, uh, the life jacket, uh, I, I guess the, uh, with the stuff that I mentioned on the life jacket. And I guess the other thing I would include on safety gear, uh, this life jacket would be number one, probably number two would be, uh, I use a dry suit uh, when it's cooler. Uh, and that, that's been a lifesaver uh, for just for hypothermia and if you were to accidentally fall over. So it's a full life, full dry suit, you know, so you can, um, you, it just keeps all the water out. So it's just, it's an excellent setup. They're not cheap, but they're worth their weight in gold as far as I'm concerned, especially if you're doing solo type stuff. Uh, and then the other thing I'll put into the mix for safety items, but some people don't consider it, but I certainly do, uh, is an outboard motor. So I have a Suzuki two and a half horsepower outboard uh, on the Tandem Island. And that has probably saved my life or my rear end more times than the, uh, than the dry suit even. Because uh, a lot of times I get caught in trying to go upwind in the Hobie and it just doesn't work well especially if you got your fighting waves and then you add in two or three knots of current, it becomes a losing proposition unless you have some external power. Um, so I've used the outboard quite a bit, um, more just as a safety equipment. And um, it's, uh, it, it's changed the whole outlook. You know, it's really almost doubled the range. It, it takes a lot of risk out of the, out of the, out of the sale uh, and it makes it more pleasurable from my experience. So that's my two cents. But how about the rest of you guys? Anything you do for safety? On that motor, is that uh, electric, gas? What's the fuel? It's just regular uh, gas. It's a four-stroke, four um, two-and-a-half horsepower outboard. Uh, so it runs on regular gasoline. There's no oil mix or anything like that. But it's not electric. Uh, it is gas, gasoline powered, uh, and it's a four stroke, uh, so it runs pretty quiet. And it only weighs about, uh, weighs about 28 pounds. How much uh, fuel do you take and how far will that get you or how long will it run, I guess? Yeah, it has a uh, internal tank to the outboard, kind of just inside the outboard itself. And, and that will run for almost an hour. Beautiful. And I can run for... Uh, you know, for a good hour at, at maybe medium so throttle. Uh, and then I carry a, a small uh, one and a half gallon uh, extra gasoline tank right on the, on the back of the tandem. Uh, so I could probably run for almost five, five, six hours running time with the motor and probably go 20, 25 miles maybe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. And, uh, Chuck, we're getting a little bit of background noise. Maybe you can just mute yourself. Oh, isn't that pretty? Yeah. Yes, you're talking. So what color do you want print like that? I didn't. Did Did that answer your question, Dirk? Yeah, that's great. And then she'll frame it. All right. Uh, what else do you guys do for safety? Oh, After we all put our John Henry's on. Sure. I have gone back to school on tides and currents and winds and all the meteorological information that I knew else years ago. Um, just trying to be a little more uh, intuitive. And, uh, you know, I, I look at a lot of sites just to see, you know, what's supposed to happen. And then I go down there and see how accurate those forecasts are. But I, I think that's a big part of it is just knowing what you're getting into up front. Yeah, it's a good point. We have good weather forecast today. Um, so you take advantage of that too, for sure, what the wind speed's going to be doing. And if there's any storms coming. All right, anyone yeah, else? Uh, I think safety? that's a good one. Like often, often I'll look at the forecast and I'll be like, yeah, okay, it's like pretty much in the realms of like being able to sail and then you get down like you load up the boat and everything get down to the water and everything and then there's white caps and the winds gusting and you know like it's it's important to have that discipline that you don't go oh, like i've put all this effort in to get out here like i'm going anyway like if it's like too questionable um so yeah that's that's something that like i need a bit more experience with like reading not just the forecast like that there's a lot to it that i don't really know much about like the how the swell the inshore offshore winds like all these different elements sort of tides like running out depending where you are but that's something i'm, I'm still uh, learning about but 
I think um, in terms of the motor uh, comments, yeah, I completely agree. Like having, so I've got a Torquedo uh, electric motor and it's, it's really good because it's quite convenient. It's very low maintenance because you can literally just charge it with your PowerPoint at home and then put it on the boat and away you go. But it does have a lot of limitations it's like in terms of um, speed and so forth. It's, like a, it's not that fast and then in terms of range it you know you've, you're stuck with a lithium battery so it's it's okay for day sailing if you sort of discipline yourself not to use it unless you're in trouble or like the sun's setting and you want to quickly get back and whatnot but if you uh, if you're planning to go on quite a lengthy sail and you want to use that to help you along it, it, you feel the limited range in terms of the battery um i've been doing quite a bit of like remote boat no, not, not boat-based camping, but accessing campsites that have no uh, power and ability to recharge it. So if you're going for more than one day, it's almost a redundant thing to bring because you've got no way to charge it. And then you're lugging this weight around for nothing just in the off chance of an emergency. So, But that's sort of lake-based sailing, so you don't exactly need it as much. But um, that's one of the main reasons why I'm looking to upgrade to something like the uh, outboard that you've got, Jim, because... Because I think it's, you know, you've got a lot of added range and you can get yourself out of a lot more trouble if you've got oh, yeah, yeah. gasoline. Like electric's just not there in terms of range and speed and power. So okay, um, that's very high on my list. Uh, the other thing, so yeah, I completely agree about the life jacket and tethering a knife and having floating flashlights, those kind of things. Uh, first aid kit's really good having a, a little bit of spare food in case you get stranded and you can't get back. Uh, VHF, so don't expect to be able to use your iPhone uh, because the screen won't work the minute you get any water on it. So a VHF radio, one that floats and fully charged and everything um, is really good. I don't know about the States, but here we have like a marine rescue sort of um, channel that you can log in and log off on if you if you want to record your journey. And then um, the other also, I carry a PLB, personal locator beacon, which is um, basically the, the satellite-based rescue thing that if you're in grave danger, you can press a button and a helicopter will come to try to find you. And uh, in addition to that, because they're actually in Australia, they're not legal like to you're not meeting all the offshore uh, requirements yeah oh, um yeah so in australia you're not actually meeting the offshore requirements if you're only carrying a plb so i have a full epa which is um a little bit bigger better battery and everything so that's uh, i've got both to, to meet that requirement um sea dye foil blankets flares like these are kind of all the things that you you need and I think the tricky thing about the Hobie is that it's sort of not classified as a boat, but it's not a kayak either. So uh, depending on where you're located, finding the right regulations and meeting them. But I think officials are pretty good. If, you, if you've got your dry suit, you've got your um, life jacket, you look like you're not a cowboy on the water. They're like, pretty good at like, if you're making an effort to meet everything. But, you know, there's stuff like needing fire extinguishers and, and things like that so it's sort of like a it's a balancing act of how much gear you can carry and yeah. if you've yeah. maxed out your weight capacity on all the essential safety items like um yeah it's, it's hard to find light things like very small uh fire extinguishers and stuff like that but um yeah there's certain things on that list that are essential um and then the other one is the Stainless steel ARCA pins, which we spoke about in quite some detail last time. That's a controversial topic, but um, for me, um, I am very fearful of capsizing. It has nothing to do with the with the boat, but it's more um, my own abilities. And, you know, when I was a kid, I um, sailed a catamaran with my father and we capsized it. And that has terrified me ever since. So, um, yeah, so that's something I'm trying to build up my confidence on because I think the natural, when you're sailing on the Hobie and, you know, the wind picks up, it's a natural thing for the um, the boat to lean and one um, like it ends up in the air and, and everything and you sort of have to trust the boat. And I'm still building my trust for the boat. <laughs> yeah. And if they turtle, it's it's tough. Yeah, you have to get them back. You know. So yeah, and you mentioned the uh, the fire extinguisher. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, 
you do have to, by regulation, if you got an outboard, then you got to have a small fire extinguisher also on the Hobie. Uh, and that adds a little more complexity to the things you got to carry. All right, we've had a couple more folks join us. Um, and I uh, want to give them a chance to introduce themselves. And for those that are just joining us, uh, we've been going for about 30 minutes or so, and we've already done the introductions, but we'll let you guys uh, join in. So uh, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, Darren, if you can just give us your name and where you're located and what you've been doing with uh, sailing or with your Hobie Islands. Hey, good morning, uh, or the afternoon, I guess. I'm losing track of what time it is, I guess. Um, I'm Darren Doherty. I live in Florida, um, the Orlando, Oviedo area. So, and haven't done anything since, uh, since just uh, before Christmas. Before Christmas, we were going out, uh, Titusville area, intercoastal waterway kind of stuff. So, um, we've got the, uh, we were out, I was on the last meeting you had uh, last yeah. year. Um, got the uh, Tandem Island, uh, the dune color, buff, uh, the white one with the spinnaker and finally got our tramplings and spinnaker. And so we played with those a little bit. Not enough time. <laughs> All right. Good. And let's see, it looks like Michael has also joined us. Michael, you want to introduce yourself and just tell us uh, where you're located and uh, what type of sailing you do? Um, I'm a beginner. I'm located in the North Fork of uh, Long Island, um, Mattituck. Um, so I'm on Peconic Bay, but um, do a lot of, um, so I started last summer. I had a, I bought a, um, a used adventure island and I had so much fun with it that this past winter, I bought a tandem island and I can't wait to get that in the, in the water. I think I've seen every single uh, video when it comes to uh, Hobie Island, especially all the mod videos. And I can't wait to get going, but I got snow on the ground. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, I'll tell you, I grew up and first learned to sail in a place called Mattituck on Long Island. Are you Island. serious? Yep. So I, I had like a that. grandparents had a house there and we had a little, there's an inlet. It's an inlet off of. Uh, off of Long Island Sound, which is a big body of water that goes out to the Atlantic Ocean, but for those not familiar with it. But yeah, I used to sail a little sunfish out through the, uh, out through the inlet, past the uh, Tavern Inn or whatever it was called, the old mill maybe, and then all the way out to the, uh, into, the, into the sound. So I spent quite a bit of time going back and forth. So welcome. Thank you. I'll just give you one note on that. On the, um, uh, I tried launching the... Um, the Adventure Island from Mattituck Inlet once, and it was the only time I had to turn around. The current was just, I mean, yeah. as you're, you know, reaching the, um, the Long Island Sound part, yeah. you can just see the waves saying, turn back, turn back. <laughs> so, yeah, anytime you're going through a, a shoal or an entrance like that, you need, you need to know what the tides and the currents are doing and try to time it so we go out with them and come back with them uh, or have some external power to help you get through those tough patches. But yeah. Yes. Uh, so yeah, well, welcome. We're about 30 minutes into our session here. Um, so uh, we're just going over what safety equipment do people currently put on their uh, islands and uh, each of us have been just kind of sharing. So uh, that's kind of just to catch you guys up where, okay. where we are. So, any other thoughts on uh, safety equipment? If, if I may, <clears throat> Jim, and others uh, comment on some of the things that have been said so far. And again, I, I don't have it yet, but I've, I've been reading a lot and reflecting. First of all, Damien, um, you mentioned the range. Have you thought about either carrying an uh, additional battery pack or um, and or a solar panel to to charge the torpedo battery. I, I don't know. I, I guess it's very difficult to charge the whole thing, but maybe you can get a little bit extra charge that might help you, um, especially if you're doing it for more than one uh, day. I also wanted to ask you as a safety measure when you when you go camping when when you actually carry a lot of stuff. 
I've been reading that some users prefer not to fill the hull with gear, but rather have it uh, tied up on the, tied down to the trampolines or, or whatever they would place there, because uh, apparently it's not, it's not completely safe to have it all in the hull, and then if you get a leak or whatever, it's, it's more complicated. I don't know if that's the case, if any of you have had any issues with that. Um, and also regarding the possibility of capsizing, is it, is it possible to capsize when you're using the trampolines? Or I, I also know that some people tie a, a line from the bow to, to the armors to try to avoid that from happening. So I, I don't know if that works or if it doesn't. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think just with the with the torpedo question, so I have looked into this. So I've got a 530 watt uh, battery, which is, I think it originally came in a 400, then there's a 500, then there's a 900. So uh, because I got mine secondhand, I was like, obviously whatever it came with, so it came with the middle of the range battery, but um, the 900 definitely would be a lot better, but I think it's like US like $800, $900 for that. Um, and that would almost double the range, but I, I think like, and I did weigh up uh, buying that, but in Australia it's like two thousand Aussie dollars to get that battery, and I thought, well, like I could buy an outboard motor for that, and obviously, I like the convenience of the torpedo, but it's like just take it off, plug it in, everything's great, and you don't need to worry about like petrol and possibly servicing a motor and stuff like that. But I think you just can't beat the range and the speed of a outboard, so. Um, take it from me like I think like if I was relying on the torpedo to get me out of like a really the weather turning or really bad currents like I would uh, I'd be a bit more stressed than what I probably will be if I have a outboard gasoline uh, motor to help me along and solar's just kind of not there really as well like I looked at panels of sort of 750 Aussie dollars to then get enough like wattage to then actually recharge but you know if you if you were setting the uh hobie up for like a multiple day expedition style thing where you're going for like weeks or months at sea then it could be a good sort of off-grid self-sustainable uh measure to have a torpedo electric motor or the hobie um what's it called the hobie i don't, I don't know what the the hobie, the hobie motor Evil. is a rebadged yeah, Evolve, that's it. Evolve, they're, a, yeah. they're a rebadged torpedo anyway. Um, I wouldn't be too keen on mounting it in the um, Mirage Drive thing because if you hit a rock or something, you're going to rip out your and probably put a, a hole in your hull and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a big investment to go down the electric route and I just don't feel it's there to bang for your buck in terms of usability, um, but it is a nice to have if you're only going for day trips or you know four hours at, at, you know, on the water and you want to just a quick easy setup maybe but um anything more substantial that i'm i'm voting for gasoline i don't even have one yet um and storing gear in the hull i've read that too um i've not done any camping with large loads on a rough sort of waterway i've only done it on sort of a flat lake and you do have a lot of weight with lugging tents and whatnot gear with you so that is a key concern of mine as well and i think um i think that the, the issue is the front hatch is uh definitely far from waterproof uh there's been a couple of i don't know if it was you jim or um someone else on youtube but there's been a couple of good mods with people who are trying to seal that uh front hatch um and just the way the boat travels with weight distribution so if i'm on the tandem i sit in the back seat um that makes the motor work better and whatnot and puts a bit more weight on the rear end. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think it's also a, you know, a fact you don't want the, um, the front of the boat piercing through waves and taking on water. Um, so that's probably why that suggestion is coming out. Bilge pumps is another thing we should probably talk about in the, in the safety stuff. Um, I've got a manual one, but I've, I've seen people putting in uh, electric ones and stuff. So um, that's something I'll be looking at. Yep, and if you one of my good. projects this summer, I bought an electric bilge pump 
and I also bought, um, I don't know, um, there's a company called Yak Power, and they have an interesting um, electrical system. So, that, you know, you can add a light or, um, uh, you know, USB ports if needed for cameras. And um, one of the things I was thinking of was a bilge pump. Yep, there are electric bilge pumps, and certainly I carry a manual one in my TI, but uh, they come in handy. Okay, you'll have a surprise where I had, I was sailing in the uh, 10,000 Islands, and all of a sudden I was, it seemed like the boat was just a little bit lower in the water. I couldn't figure out what it was, you know, and open up the hatch, and it was, the boat was half full of water. Oh, boy. Oh. And uh, so I pulled out my uh, hand pump, you know, bilge pump, and basically got it wild, and then I tried to sail as fast as I could to the shore, because I was about three miles offshore, and um, luckily I made it to the beach, only to find I got a hole in the bottom of my boat. So anyway, that's another story from another time. Wow. So that brings up a question I've had. Is, is Has anybody found anything that's good for patching holes on the plastic in the water? Yeah, I've used them. I've come across, unfortunately, I've had to learn that multiple times. Um, so what I end up, I carry now as part of my kit on the boat, I carry a, uh, some of this uh, flex tape, I don't know, flex seal. Uh, it's like a maybe four inch wide roll, like it's a big roll of duct tape, but you can put it on actually underwater. And for an emergency patch, it will get you out of danger. So I always keep some of that on the boat. Oh, that's smart. So, I have some of that for a gutter repair. Same thing, yep. It's gonna go on my kit. <laughs> yep, I highly recommend taking some. Uh, Cause you never know what will happen. So that, that flex seal tape actually does work on the plastic, huh? Yeah. And yeah. I, I do, uh, you know, I, I do like clean the hole first with some, a little bit of alcohol I'll work for an emergency to get it on. But then when I get back to the, my home, I'll take it off and I'll do a, a more permanent patch with uh, cleaning the surface with uh, isopropyl alcohol and then reapplying a couple layers of that tape uh, um, you know, for a crack or something in the hole. And you can weld it, you know, there's other techniques that you can use, um, you know, beside, but if it's something you can t put in the back of your boat and have it on the water, you can't, can't go wrong there. And it doesn't take up too much space. So, all right. Uh, and it looks like uh, Darcy has joined us. Uh, I see a person's name is Darcy. Darcy, we can't see you or hear you, but if you want to introduce yourself, you're welcome to. And if you don't want to, that's fine too. Um, and we've done, everyone else has introduced themselves so far. So I think we're, we're doing good. All right, let's, um, Darcy, you're welcome just to listen in. And if you want to introduce yourself, you can. Um, all right, so next up on the agenda was to go over kind of uh, what modifications have you done to the islands uh, for coastal sailing, and then also maybe to do a, a walk around uh, of, of one of your boats. So I, I'm actually going to try to do a walk around my TI. It's in the garage. I have it half set up, and I'm just going to kind of walk around with my cell phone. And uh, so that's what I'm going to propose to do next, and I explain some of the modifications I've made. And then I can turn it over to, uh, is anybody else going to do a walk around of your boat? Okay, so maybe just me. So we'll hope, we'll hope to give it a shot. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and fire up my cell phone here. And I'm going to try and uh, join by my cell phone in another room. So I'm going to let you guys go for a minute or two while I walk out to the garage. Uh, and then if you can do me a big favor when you get out there, once I start talking, if you guys can just make sure that you can hear me. Sometimes I do this and nobody can hear what I'm saying. You might be able to see it, but you can't hear me. So give me a, like a thumbs up or something. I'll look and I'll be able to see that to know you can hear me or just talk. And let me get the uh, screen share button going here. Allow multiple folks. Okay. So you guys are on your own for about a minute. Let me see if I can keep going in the garage here. I'll, I'll say probably the best modification we've made is getting a, a real trailer for it, not not something rinky dink. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried struggling loading it into either a, uh, a truck or car topping. We originally I had originally gotten a, a bed extender for my truck and I have a full size truck and we fiddled with that a few times. And we found a, an aluminum trailer that 
we were able to modify and put a couple of the, uh, the cradles on and uh, everybody I've seen that gets a trailer or, or has gotten a trailer, it's, it's well worth the investment. Um, even for me putting it, we keep ours in the side yard. So for me wheeling it from the driveway into the, into work, where it sits and stores away, it's, it's, it's been worth it. So I don't know what other experiences you guys, probably a lot of you keep them in your garage. It's, that's not really an option for me. So I second that having a trailer is a godsend. Like I can't even, I, you know, if I try to move my hope one meter up the shore, I'm struggling and I don't know how people get it on their roof of their car and whatnot. So you know, I have a trailer as well, but um, it's, it's very convenient with that. Albeit there is issues if you're then going to boat ramps around where I live, it's uh, very busy to get parking and stuff. And sometimes I wish I didn't have to contend with a trailer, but um, yeah, I, could, I couldn't do it without it. I've even done some launching on the wheels, like sliding it off the trailer and then onto the wheels. And it's a, it's a bit of a struggle for me in terms of, I think it's just because I've got so much gear and equipment now, adds a lot of weight. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. And you yep. can, I guess you could see me. So uh, let me uh, turn around here. So what I'm gonna do is just uh, take a walk in the boat. So let me know if, uh, can you see the boat? I can. And is it better like this, or is it better if I go like this? Landscape. That's better. Okay, we'll do landscape. Anyway, so this is just the uh, this is just the uh, my garage, and outside those doors are not, nothing but snow. But in here, it's uh, not quite as cold. Uh, so it's on a trailer, um, and I've just started the bow. So uh, this is, you know, this is a 2016 Hobie uh, tandem island. And actually, uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a quick walk around, and then I'm going to uh, also fire off these cameras, which I might add into the mix uh, when we stick it up on uh, on YouTube. So anyway, that's just a quick walk around. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. All right. And I'm just firing up uh, these cameras, and we're just going to capture a couple points of view. So you've probably seen some of the YouTube videos I've done. These are the cameras that I have and the electronics. I'll go over that in just a minute. But as far as the, the modifications, um, I'll start on the bow. Let me just get this going. There we go. All right. So I tip one of the east, one of the on here and it's uh, can you hear me no we lost you there but we can hear you now all right can you see the video playing some lagging in that all right give me a second here guys i'm gonna try and reconnect give me a second oh That's not your sailing attire. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, and is that any better or worse? That's good. All right. Um, so, so what I was trying to explain is I had two handholds here, and um, I had one of their standard Hobie handholds, but it just rotted out and snapped off one day. Uh, and so what I do is just have two two handholds, both in the bow and the stern, and I find that really helps uh, to be able to pull the boat up on a trailer up on the beach. So that's one of the things that I do. Uh, one of the other modifications I've done is is for the electronics. So I have one of these uh, Yak uh, power uh, boxes in here. It's got a couple of uh, sealed lead acid batteries in it that are daisy chained together, and this provides power for uh, a Garmin. Um, GPS uh, that I use that has also the sonar built in. So, and I can probably run two days nonstop, almost like, you know, 24 hours of sailing uh, on one charge of this battery. So it's pretty, a uh, fairly good capacity here. Uh, and then probably can't see, but down inside the hole here uh, is the V-brace. Uh, and there's a, a bolt on the bottom down here. 
that holds the bottom of the V-brace. And I did have that snap off while sailing and the mast tipped over. Uh, so that's one of the, I had to swap that out and get a, a new bolt put in there. So it's one safety thing I would definitely recommend is periodically check this bolt at the bottom of your V-brace and just make sure that both V-braces are tight and that that bolt is tight. And I put in some uh, Loctite on there, red Loctite to hold it in place. Um, the other thing I'll point out is just uh, the uh, beads in here on a rolling furling system. You guys are probably familiar with it. Uh, when you trailer the boat, those can bounce out uh, and it becomes very hard to reef the sail. Uh, so one of the things I've done, other people have seen it too, just stick a pool noodle in there like this, kind of holds those beads in place. Uh, the other thing is uh, I go under bridges a lot when I'm going out to sea and you have to take the mast up and down, up and down. And every time you take it up and down when you're on the boat, this flexes a little bit and you can lose some of those uh, beads or marbles, as I call them, ball bearings. So I always keep some extras uh, around and they're really, I had to replace this plate uh, because this gets deformed a little bit. Um, so other just safety things, I always sail solo, but I always carry two mirage drives in the tandem in case one breaks. Sometimes you run aground, you bend it, and of course, always keep them leashed in. Uh, just some simple basic things like that. Uh, what else? I keep a roller on top of the AMA, uh, and this is an old uh, yoga roller that I modified. Uh, you can clip it off fast. You can stick it underneath the bow to pull the boat up on the beach. Um, instead of carrying a set of wheels. So this is what I find very useful. Plus, have an anchor. I don't you anchor that much, but sometimes in emergencies, you, you, you do need to anchor. I use this very lightweight uh, Cooper anchor. Um, it's uh, kind of like plastic material, but it's very durable. It's hollow, hollow uh, but its design is that it digs in pretty good, uh, and it can hold you. And I keep it stored in the hatch inside this bag, um, and it's tied up so it runs up through the front, uh, out through a ring on the on the bow, uh, and then it comes back to a jam cleat here uh, on the front um, um, bar that goes across. It's got a jam cleat here so that I can control the anchor from inside the boat. I don't have to go up to the bow uh, to get it to retrieve it or whatever. So that's a, a just an anchor setup. And again, I don't use it that much, but occasionally I do. So let me just do a, a sound check. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I have a, a, a simple uh, red trailer that I've modified. That's the trailer that it's sitting on. Uh, but here's the uh, life jackets. So it's a cut tat uh, life jackets. So I keep the EPIRB in here, some safety lights, uh, a knife. Got the DHS radio. Sorry, this is kind of bouncing around a little bit. Uh, the DHS radio. And I also keep the, uh, uh, you know, waterproof holder for the, uh, for the cell phone. So uh, that's part of the safety gear. And then uh, we have a Garmin uh, unit here uh, that does both. Uh, it's, it carries all the charts, blue water charts for all the coastal areas of the U.S. Uh, built in. So I find that very handy. Uh, and then it also has the um, uh, sonar. So I have a through hole sonar. I don't use the... Uh, ones that stick down below the boat. This is actually stays inside the boat, shoots through the, through the uh, polypropylene, and that does works perfectly fine. You can see the fish, although I don't do a lot of fishing, but it, mostly for the depth. Uh, I keep a compass on here, uh, just so I can, also as kind of a backup for navigation. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the dry suit. So this is cut attack dry suit. I do have a, a hood here. I do, on, when I go ice sailing, uh, I'll, I'll use the, the helmet with the visor to keep the ice water off your face. So only in very cold conditions, like I've just completed a sail here in January. Uh, so I'll use this helmet uh, to help keep me warm. Uh, so that's the dry suit. Uh, this is the Suzuki, uh, two and a half horsepower. It sits right on top of this rack that uh, you've probably seen a video I might have done on this, but it's just uh, aluminum stock tubing, square tubes. Uh, and it, it mounts uh, on a couple other square tubes that sit on top of a track. As you can see this track here. There's a track mount system uh, with a metal plate underneath it. So there's a backing plate that's underneath the boat inside the hole, uh, and that bolts 
you know, right into the into the bolt, uh, into the the hole right there. It's very strong, very firm, uh, and this has just a couple uh, wing nuts, if you will, that you can untwist on both sides and lift this completely off. Uh, and I uh, normally just take the motor off and you know put it in my car for transportation. I just mount it on the boat right before I put it in the water. Uh, so this is that's a Suzuki two and a half horsepower. And if I can get my one hand operation here, just slow it down. So that's the, you can see how far it sticks down below. So it doesn't go that far down below the boat. It's probably only, you know, uh, maybe six inches or so, but it's enough to keep the prop in the water. Uh, and this is the short, short shaft. There is a long shaft, uh, but I found this one really works, works well. Um, and it doesn't really, you know, run into hitting the, the ground underneath. And again, this is a gas tank, it's an internal gas tank inside here. It holds about uh, about a half a gallon, uh, and it's got very simple controls for you know neutral, forward, uh, fuel supply, the throttle. And I carry a, a one and a half gallon of extra fuel here, so I can go quite a long distance with this. You know, probably thirty miles with this uh, internal tank plus what I would have here. So you can go quite a quite a long distance. Uh, this is the camera mount that I mentioned. Uh, this is a Garmin Verb Ultra 30 a camera that's actually taking some pictures right now, I hope. And then that's tied to a, uh, if I can go, go open this up, rear hatch. So there's actually, I put one of these lithium batteries right zip tied to the bottom of the hatch uh, to keep it up out of the water so it stays as high as possible. And that powers uh, this external camera, uh, and this uh, with this battery, I can probably get a you know, three or four day sail without without having to recharge it. It goes quite quite a long period of time, and I keep quite a bit of extra gear in here. You can see uh, some pulleys for the main sheet. Um, there's also uh, extra pins for the rudder uh, that I keep in the back here, as well as. Uh, safety players and that kind of activity. So anyway, that's part of what's there in the back here. Uh, of course, the sail and the mast. And, and I just recently got a new sail. I've been sailing this boat since 2016 and I did wear out the sail. Um, it started to fail in the clear area where the, uh, started getting some holes in that clear area, mostly from, I think, over stressing it when I was trailering it. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is just use the Akas that are extended. These are the safety lines that you see here. So if you were to have a failure of this Aka brace, which everyone's always got uh, nervous about, and this is a pin for it, uh, that this, and I generally don't sail with the tramps unless I have extra visitors on the boat. Uh, so most of the time I don't have the tramps deployed. I have them up here, uh, but if I'm sailing solo, I generally don't deploy the tramps. So these safety lines help keep the, the amas out in case you were to have a failure of that brace. Uh, also, this, these safety lines serve a dual purpose. This one here, actually, uh, all I have to do is unclip a, a carabiner there and I can collapse the, the ama, but it actually pulls here and then pulls out the tension for the, you can't really see it, but for the spray skirt. So actually when I, raise, uh, collapse, and open the mamas that actually tensions the spray skirt uh, that's on the out of here, so I don't have to worry about tightening that up. Sometimes if you don't have that, then you can't really close those amas uh, without first undoing your skirts. So this is a way to kind of make that happen. Uh, I think that's probably not the whole show, but it's enough to give you a taste for the, for the tandem island. And again, I've owned the uh, Adventure Island and uh, now the Tandem Island. And up on the ceiling over there, I got the manual two-person Kona paddle-only kayak uh, that you see up here on the ceiling. And then, of course, this is the rest of the kayak gear over here and the rest of the safety gear over there. And some uh, wheels when I'm on the beach. So let me just stop there and see if anybody else has any questions before I go back to, the, to my office. And can you still hear me? Do you normally just, take um, a just on... Go ahead. You normally take a paddle. I I bought one that's like a, a two piece that you can take apart. You strap it there to the side there. 
Yeah, and it's a good question. Uh, I don't really use the paddle that much. Um, I have used just a, a this type of paddle. I don't know if you can see it. It's just a uh, it's, you know just with a handle on the top, and you can take this apart. You can fit it inside, and sometimes I'll just keep it on top of the boat like that. And then some people like to go with the the longer ones on top. And again, I don't really use it that much. Um, other questions? Yeah, Jim, is the um, the separate gas can connected via a hose, or no. do you refill? I just I have a, one of these no drip um, valves on here, which work very well. It's got a cover to keep the water from getting in, uh, and it's a push button control. Uh, and I just simply you know loosen this up here, and I refill directly from the main fill tank up here. You so lift has, it out and pour it in. Oh, yeah, I could do this while I'm under, you know, at sea so that I can actually just pull this out and just simply loosen this and then pour the fuel right in through there using this, uh, using this valve connector. So, yeah, it's manual gravity feed. You pick it, pick it up, hold it above here, and drain it in. But it's worked fine. I've had no trouble with that approach. And for those not familiar with it, let me see if I can pop the cover to this one handed here. One second. So, underneath the cover, you know, this is the engine here, but this is the internal gas tank. And this internal gas tank holds, you know, maybe, you know, uh, forget the specs on it, but it's maybe, uh, yeah, maybe half a gallon. And so I could fill this, you know, maybe four more times with the with this red reservoir over here, but it's done manually. It's not a, it's not done through a, it's not done through uh, some kind of a hose type setup. Okay. Um, but it gets excellent range and it gets excellent power for getting through uh, shoals. Uh, hold on a second. What's your manual build? Look like what's that 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 bilge pump that you were talking about i think it was manual what does that look like yeah that's right here you can see it there's a, a handle right here which you can pump it up and down uh this fits in the bottom of the boat uh, and this is the hose that just fits over the side so this is just you just simply take this off and you stick it in the hatch down where the water is you know, typically I was like, this is the rear seat. This is where I normally sail from. And I mentioned that the uh, one time I was under sail and the, the boat seemed to be awful low. And I opened up this hatch and I found I was, you know, water was right up to where my hand is. You know, a good three or four inches off the bottom here. So I just snipped, stick the uh, bilge pump right down this hatch and the hose goes over the side and you just hand pump it. And that works very well. It looks like a big bike pump. Yeah, exactly. We're here. I could just, uh, just on the um, just on the motor, Jim, um, and I just want to add that your outboard motor mount is famous among the Hobie community. It's the gold standard for um for this. So well done on on the design, and everything. Do you uh, fix the motor so you know you just steer with the rudder? Um, or yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, you can steer with the motor. Um, but, and I have done an emergency. I've had a couple of times when I've been at sea where the rudder has failed for whatever reason. And then I, I had to use this to steer. So you can turn it like this and see me turning it. All right. But I typically lock it just in one fixed position and I steer with the normal Hobie rudder. I also, yep. I, I also tie the, the motor down the clip to the mount. Um, you know, you probably have probably seen a video in the past where I was actually returning from the surf launch and we got hit sideways with a wave and capsized in the surf, which is not pretty. Uh, but I had the motor on and the motor was underwater for over 30 minutes in the salt water, you know, surf. Uh, and I thought I lost it, but no, it stayed on through all of that. Didn't lose the mount, didn't lose the motor. It did take me a couple of days to clear out the motor and get all the salt water out of it. We do a few things, but it's been running ever since. So knock on wood, it's been doing pretty good. 
but uh, it's a good yeah, discipline. Any anything you want to keep to um, have on a leash, particularly the Mirage drives. I've heard stories of people that have not yeah. tethered the Mirage drives, and you flip and they go to the bottom of the sea, and that's yeah. So I got the Mirage drives tethered. Yeah. So the Mirage drives is tethered. The seats are tethered. Every camera on here is tethered. All of these cameras are all tethered. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of tying stuff down because uh, I'm in some rough conditions periodically. Um, the rudder is also another important thing to keep it. I've busted off a few of the pins, mostly on surf launches. These pins snap and you have to pull out the pins uh, and that can be a little tricky on the water. Uh, the other thing you want to also make sure is always make sure you put your uh, drain plug back in. I've made a mistake a time or two when that didn't get done. So I'm doing that right now. Um, but you want to make sure that you got good uh, tension on your, on, on the um, lines for your rudder. And these are a little loose right now. I got to, I got to do some work on those. All right. Any other questions? Just, just yeah. on the rudder yeah. pin, Jim. Sorry. Um, I've like changed mine a couple of times on land and it is extremely hard. Like I've needed a screwdriver and a little rubber mallet to like bang it out because it's just, I think it wears out in certain spots and it gets caught. Like if you, if you break yeah. it at sea, is it easier to get out because it's actually yeah. shattered or is it, yeah, how yeah. do you deal, deal with that? Yeah, you're right. That can be sometimes difficult. Uh, they used to, they come with a cotter pin you're supposed to put on the bottom. I never use it because that cotter pin can be, pain to try and get that out especially if you're at sea and the waves are rocking around and you're under you got your arms underwater trying to find that um so you know and and normally if you rock this rudder back and forth you can loosen up the strain on the, on the pin to where you can actually pull it out uh and sometimes you might have to push it out sometimes the top piece will break off and you don't have it anymore it's, you know it broke down in here somewhere uh, so, but you can use a new pin to kind of push it all the way out um, so that's, you know, some of the things that I've done. So I've probably replaced four or five of those while under, you know, while at sea, not on the beach. Uh, and it can be done. You have to lay on your, lay on your stomach across the back here. Uh, and now with these mounts, sometimes that makes it a little bit more of a challenge to get back in here. But, you know, that's the way to do it. And uh, these are way loose here. I got to figure out why those are so loose. But uh, other questions? Yes. Um, on the motor, if I have my nautical terms correct, it's mounted on the starboard side? Correct. I mean, you could put it on either port or starboard. I just decided to put it on the, uh, on the starboard side. Uh, and I built my, I built my uh, mortar mount, you know, just to have it on the, on the starboard side. I could actually unbolt this and flip it around and do it on the other side. Uh, and I've seen some Hobie Tandem Island sailors that do a lot more or offshore than I do, they'll actually extend this out a little bit further uh, and have two motors, one on each side, and actually go for redundancy in case one fails. Um, but I've found this motor to be very reliable, uh, even in cold weather, even with the abuse that I've, you know, gone through with it. Um, and so I, I just use the one. And then that's one of the beauties of the, the Hobie Tantamount. You can use the pedal drive, you can use the sail, you can paddle it, uh, and you can use the motor. So you got you know four four ways to, to make it. But when you get into really tough currents, like three to four knots, and if you're going against the waves and against the wind, it's just almost impossible to to uh, if you're doing just trying to pedal it or paddle it against that kind of current and that kind of wind. Uh, I found it was just near impossible. You get exhausted. And this makes it a dream. You just fire it up and it rips. And this, you can get up to, you know, close to seven knots with this. Um, and I hardly ever use it wide open on the throttle. It's probably the most I've ever gone is like half open. And it still goes very well uh, with speed and torque. All right. Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> Another question. And I, I don't know if you have an answer to that. You mentioned that you were using the version of that motor that has a short shaft. Yeah. I was, like, I was actually looking into the possibility of a, a torpedo, but now that the new Tandem Islands will be able to legally carry more powerful boats, I was thinking of the Travel um, 1100. 
um, the, the torpedo. That comes in two sizes, two shaft sizes, um, 24.5 and 30 inches, long and short. Which one do you think would fit your mount? Uh, because as Damien rightly said, uh, your mount is the gold standard when it comes to motor mounts with the Hobies. Uh, I'm just going to grab a square and tell you, you can tell for yourself. Let me see. So from where that motor sits, if I can get it in here. So that's uh, right down to there. And according to this, that's about 20. Uh, I'm trying to read it in the dark here. Looks like about 22 inches maybe 23, 24 inches down to here. So from the, where the top of the motor would sit, let's say the transom of the boat, which is this, this piece right here, it's about 24 inches to the bottom of that prop. And I don't know what it'd be in centimeters. No, that's, that's fine. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically the short version. I mean, five more inches would already be too long in, in your opinion, I imagine? Yeah, I, I, I go across a lot of shallow um, water and you know, I get this works perfect for me. It's, it stays submerged, it doesn't pull up and suck air or cavitate uh, it's, and it doesn't stick down too far where it's gonna pick up rocks and that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, to me, it just, it's, uh, and you got the water intake here, you know, it's, it's a water cooled motor. So it's taking in water, going through a water pump to cool the pistons. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, that's, it, this, this step works fine for me. Yeah. Cu a couple so. tips. Please go ahead. Well, I just had a couple tips on the motor there is I, I use the same motor you're using. Yeah. And uh, I would agree with you to mount the motor as high as you feel comfortable because I, I initially had it a little bit lower than where yours was, yeah. but I gained about 40% in efficiency in gasoline use by mounting it so that the cavitation plate is only below the water when I'm sitting in it. Okay, yeah. Uh, the other thing I've noticed with the motor is that I've used mine three years now, and since I never really run it above about eighth or quarter throttle, uh, the car pauses down a lot of called seafoam. Yeah, could and you, uh, your, your, when I, your audio dropped out there, could you repeat that? Um, because I run the throttle only a maximum of about quarter throttle, uh, carbon can deposit at such low RPMs. And so I use an additive called sea foam, and that keeps the little jets in the carburetor uh, clean and uh, makes it starting on one pull all the time. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and I, I don't have the sea foam, I do keep... Uh in the boat, on the water, I keep something like this, just a stabilizer for the fuel, more to, um, if there's any water that might get in there, helps kind of control that. But uh, yeah, the sea foam, I'll have to, that's a good tip, I'll have to look into that. And I did, back to the mount, I did, this mount does sit, not on the rail, but a couple notches above it, so that the waves that come by here don't splash and come back and hit you, uh, when you're sitting in the rear seat. So I did raise this up a little bit uh, so that the waves come underneath here and don't hit you. All right, other, other questions? Yeah, to kind of change the, the topic a little bit, um, colder weather clothes or what you wear, not necessarily for uh, ice, sailing we don't, we don't get a whole lot of that down here in florida but more for the uh the 40s and 50s kind of temperatures um yeah i've yeah. seen people talk about things like using waders and in jacket you know the, the just heavy rain jackets um you know trying to figure out what's going to be comfortable 
and and still move maneuverable to be on the water. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, from my perspective, I'm, I get chilled pretty easily now. I'm a little bit older, so uh, I do find myself wearing this dry suit more than I thought I ever would. And I even wore it in Florida, you know, running down the Indian River, you know, around um, Port Canaveral and down the Indian River and Banana River. So I've used it on long runs where you're going to get, might get hypothermia. Short runs, maybe not as much in the warmer weather. But uh, all right, I'm going to... Uh, sign off here and I go back to my desk. Any other questions about the boat before I, before I move? Uh, just, one. On, just on the, how oh, you got. Go ahead. I was wondering where you might bring your fire extinguisher. Oh yeah, that's a good question. I did mention that. Uh, so there's a small fire extinguisher uh, just below this gas can. Uh, so I got a, a, a safety, hold on a second, Let's see if I can get in there. All right, now you can see, so underneath the gas can, I have a first aid kit and I have a small uh, extinguisher right here. Uh, so I keep that and I also keep a, a couple of these waterproof protectors for cell phones uh, and I actually use these for batteries. Uh, just for the cameras that I carry on board, keep them dry. But yeah, there's a, this is a uh, fire extinguisher. This white cylinder is the fire extinguisher. I noticed a couple of water bottles in there, Jim. Oh yeah, I keep, uh, I keep uh, emergency supplies of water in multiple places, um, in the pockets primarily, but also in the crate. And on longer runs, I'll put it inside the hole. So. And I, you know, I kept a number of dry bags um, that I put a spare set of clothes in. Uh, I also have a spare handheld GPS uh, that I could use as a backup in case the primary one fails, uh, and some other dry clothes or another dry bag stuffed in the bow. And back to this Garmin unit, this is looking at the back of it. It gets hit by the waves all the time, and occasionally. Moisture gets in there and I, I lose the connection. So I've been trying to, if anybody has any good ideas about how to waterproof this better, I've seen some people just stick a plastic bag over it and zip tight at the bottom. But um, anyway, that's one of the areas I'm, I haven't really found good success uh, on how to, how to avoid that. And then I mentioned the lights. So, um, and these have burned out, which I need, I need to replace. But I do have lights on the port side. Uh, in the starboard side, and then also in the rear uh, that I use as the running lights uh, for the boat. I don't, they, I don't know if that shows up or not on the camera. but um, and, and I put plastic around them and kind of uh, built them so that they hold up a little bit better uh, in the salt water conditions. And then the same thing on the back. These white things on this pole here are, are just the lights. And... And I'll fire up several of these when I'm going out at night uh, so that it can be seen by others primarily. All right, I'm going to stop there and let you guys keep talking. I'm going to go back to my desk. So let me... Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, um, if, um, and it, it relates to the AMAs and the safety connection. I've seen a video or maybe it was James talking about it, where somebody um, drilled through the AMA and put a pin in. Has has anyone done that? In in the AMA here? No, I haven't haven't done that. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I think. Are you talking about the bit in the Aka where it connects to the hull, and um, you know how there's been. Like yes. separations? Yes. Yes. Keep in lines. Yeah. So have you all yeah, done that? Have... Well, I've no. accomplished the same thing with just a piece of spectra cord to hold it in place so that the bar does not come, re from, come removed from the hull. What size and, hole did you drill through there? And that... Uh, it did it without drilling. Okay. Uh, combination of a bungee loop 
and a spectra cord, and that way I can put it off very quickly if I want to put them in and out. Got it. And I mentioned Hobie, earlier, Hobie also released a um a free upgrade, and it was to fix the um that sort of spring plastic clip mm -hmm. that holds the arcas yeah. in place. So um, there has been people that have drilled the hole and put like a little sort of stainless steel bolt Pen. in there to keep yeah. it. But um, the, the concern some of us had, we talked about this in the last Zoom, was um, the, the way the armors sit is not exactly flat with the water and they do require a bit of flex up and down. And if you've bolted it in, you could potentially create some added tension on the steel. Um, so that's something to consider. Yeah. And can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Can you, all right. These are the uh, capsized ropes I mentioned earlier. I just keep them tied on one of the handles here, runs up through the ACA, and then back to a clip here. So if it capsizes, I can just undo this clip and use this rope to help tip the boat right side back up. And I have this on both, both armors. Where does it actually anchor to? Sorry, Jim. So what's your main sort of point to pull it yeah, back so up? Right? It's just, just the anchored handle. to right to here, right to this handle. So the idea would be that if the boat's turtled, uh, it's upside down. You know, you would come stand on one armor on, on the low side and you would use this rope. You just unclip it, go and it would you know give you a, a place to pull. Um, so as it gets up in the air, you can pull it all the way over. So you just disconnect it here, it comes out, and then it, it's attached to right here to the handle on both armors. So there's a separate rope for each arm. Has that happened to you, Jim? I, when I capsized the one time in the surf and I didn't have that, um, that's when I decided to put it on. I haven't capsized since. And I hope I don't have to use it, but it's, but it's there <laughs> in case I need it. Mm. All right, I'm going to go back to my office. And I'll join you in a minute. Something I've been looking at in terms of power for anyone interested, there's an Australian company called FPV Power, and they're creating some really good uh, things. And, and I've noticed even in the States, they're getting some attention now, but they're doing a, um, like they've got 17.5 amp hour lithium batteries and they've got like a four way distribution board with like a remote control. And the, the reason they're um, quite appealing is the batteries are fully waterproof and they also are extremely light compared to existing uh, things on the market. So I'm looking at that. Jim, I was just mentioning there's a, a new thing, FPV power. Um, yeah. I've been releasing some good looking batteries and stuff. Yeah. Has anyone heard of a, a Texas paddle? The race? No, there's a, um, a company in Texas that's created a motor that you're able to pull up and down and it goes through the, I forgot what it's called, but on the bottom of the Hobie, there's a plate no. where I have my transducer mounted. So it's a transducer plate, but a motor lives in there. Yeah. Literally, um, you can pull it up and down and it's electric. No, I, have, I don't have an experience with that. I haven't seen that. It's called Texas Power. But it looks very small. Yes, you too. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen that, um, so I can't really speak to it. Um, I, I did hear some similar things that were more, more set up like trolling motors for people who want to do some trolling for fishing, uh, where you only go like one mile an hour or something like that. Uh, and that, I think, works well for fishing, but for the type of uses that we're talking about where you need it going in emergency, you know, ocean type conditions uh, that wouldn't have enough power. I don't think, uh, to provide what you're looking for, at least in my, my opinion, but, but I, I'm not that familiar with it. All right. So, uh, I apologize for taking so long going through that, uh, tour of the boat, but, um, gave you some ideas of at least how the engine set up on there. Um, so on 
we were supposed to go for about 90 minutes. Uh, we're pretty close to the end of that time, but uh, I'm okay to go a little bit longer and, and open up whatever questions you guys might have or other modifications that you guys have done. Anybody else want to share what they've done with their boat, their islands? I know you don't use a spinnaker on yours. I don't, all the videos of, that you've put out there, I don't, I've never seen you use a spinnaker. I've seen the, uh, the other person that's on the forum, um, fusion engineering or whatever it is. Um, and he's got a jib he's made. Yeah. We've just started playing with our spinnaker a little bit. Um, I think you said once that you have one, but you just yeah. have it, you don't really use no, it. I've, I've had the uh, Hobie spinnaker for several years. I have used it on multiple occasions. Uh, when it first came out, the topper they had on top of the mast, uh, it's, it's kind of set up where you have a, a line that goes from the bow up over the top of the mast all the way down to the stern, and there are no stays on either side. Uh, and so if you can just imagine a triangle from the bow up to the top of the mast and another triangle from the top of the mast down to, the, down to where the main sheet clips on. Uh, and when they originally released the spinnaker, uh, every time you tacked, you know, from as you're tacking – even downwind, a lot of times you might tack downwind with the spinnaker, you'd have to pull in, you'd have to reef the mainsail because the, the mainsail sticks out a little bit and it has that uh, uh, batten's tips on it that uh, stick up a little bit and it always would interfere with that um, line. And so you could still does. It's yeah. even with the, even because ours is the new, newest one, but yeah. it's still the line you either have to reef in or loosen the spinnaker enough you can flip the line over that. Yeah. That yeah. And that became so annoying to me that I end up using the spinnaker less and less. Uh, that's one. Um, I also took out the battens in my, in my sail and cut off the tips to shorten them a little bit so that they wouldn't interfere with that line. Uh, and then they since come out with that three inch block that sits on top of the mast now to raise it up a little bit higher uh, to give it better clearance. So there, Hobie has, a, I think, a free upgrade. Uh, it's like, and maybe it came with yours, so you maybe, maybe it's just, but I know the early Spinnaker ones uh, kits did not have that, and it sat closer to the, just the top of the mast. Yeah, there's no, well, we just got ours last, I mean, during this last year. I mean, probably yeah. the, in, there's, uh, there's probably like a black, uh, small black cylinder that sits on top of the mast. Yeah, but it doesn't raise it up that much. Yeah, you know, like two or three inches. Yeah, not that much. So anyway, I got good. I got frustrated with that. I end up not using the spinnaker for that for one reason for that. The uh, other part was occasionally I got overpowered, and the mass would tip forward. And there's no internal uh, support really for that mass tipping forward. You know, they have the V braces for side to side stresses uh, underneath, but the fore and aft uh, tensions on that mast. You know, and I ended up getting a crack in the bottom of my hole after a couple of years because of that. And I decided just, I'm just not going to put it through that stress. Uh, I am interested in getting more like a Hobie 16 type jib, Hobie Cat 16, Hobie Cat 16, taking that jib, a small jib and trying to figure out a way to fit it to the front okay. of the, uh, uh, of the Hobie tandem island. But I, I just haven't had time to uh, you know, figure out how to st structurally strengthen it to, to be able to cover that. And that's why I was really hoping that Hobie would, you know, come out with a new version of the tandem Island, you know, called uh, the offshore Island yeah. or whatever <laughs> that would have that built in. Cause I'm, I'm tired of building all this stuff from scratch myself. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but in the meantime, I'm just living with what I got. All right. How about the rest of you guys? I don't want to dominate this whole session uh, any other ideas that from the rest of you uh, about modifications you've made to your islands? Anybody do anything creative? My modifications are yet to come. <laughs> but I, I'm sold on the Suzuki. So I'm definitely going that way and, and I'm going to duplicate your amount. Yeah, for the, the Suzuki was, I, I went, went that way for power, for range, and for cost, you know, you could pick up a Suzuki for around 800 bucks or less. Um, and when you add all that, uh, going the electric, you know, it would probably double that cost. 
and uh, you get like half or a third the range. So anyway, it was just a good fit for me. It's not for everybody, but for what I do, it works well. It's just on the Suzuki, for someone who has not yet bought their outboard, do you still think that's the gold standard and that that's what you would go for if you're buying something today or is there better you know, out there? I know there's a lot of... Uh, the ones most common ones I've seen on islands would probably be the Suzuki number one, and maybe the Honda small Honda engine would be number two. Um, I think either of them could work well. You know, um, I could say the Suzuki has done well for me. That's all I can say. I, never, I haven't tried others, so um, I'm I'm sure there are other good motors out there. Other questions? And Chuck, you have the Suzuki too, right? I do, yes. What's, what's been your experience? Uh, it's, uh, I, I have the same impression that you do. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world if you're going out where the winds and waves are, are strong. Yeah. Uh, on Lake Superior, it's, it is, as you've mentioned already, a real safety feature. Up there, we get waves very quickly with little wind and you need to get off yeah. and if the wind is against you and it's you can't get off just sailing or pedaling you need some more power so yeah. it's really important to keep you from getting into positions you don't want to be in exactly it's gotten me out my mine has gotten me out of similar trouble where i just had to run for safety either from storms or waves or current and uh, i would not have been able to do it otherwise Mm -hmm. All right, other, other questions, other ideas? Just, um, just on mods, there's, there's one from a guy in um, Queensland that I haven't seen anywhere else. I'll try to show it on my screen, but um, it might be a little bit blurry. But he, um, this guy up in Queensland, he put like a um, marine ply uh, sort of board over the front seat of his tandem island so he hmm. can... Now Stand walk all over that. He yeah. can fish on it. He can. He's got a couple of like swing hatches built into it, and that um, that looked like a pretty cool mod for because there's I think a lot of people that sail solo with the tandem island, and you know you either just have dry bags or gear sitting there, but you might not utilize the front half of the boat. Um, so yep. that's something no, that to consider. Good. Yeah, and that's one of the things I'm trying to get Hobie to do is uh, come up with an, an uh, update to their tandem islands that would go more like the out modern Outback, which has a much flatter deck for standing on it and much bigger hatches that are waterproof. Uh, you know, the, the, they have a much cleaner design with the more recent mold changes that they've done for the Outback and some of the other kayaks from Hobie uh, that make it easier to stand on for fishing and that kind of stuff. Uh, and they just haven't brought those ideas to the Tandem Island or the Adventure Island yet. So I'm, I was hoping that might make some updates there, but they, they have not. So uh, we're still waiting for those. I think our, our first Zoom meeting, we kind of shared some of those ideas, but, um, but that looked interesting. Do you have any idea, Jim, on whether or not they're actually working on it? Do, would you expect them to no. release something by next year? I have no idea. I know I did pass all these ideas on to them you know, through the forum, you know, over the last couple of years, but, uh, and if they ever do come out with, you know, a substantial number of these, I will certainly, you know, probably upgrade to that, if you will, and sell my current one and move on to a new one. But, uh, uh, you know, haven't really seen that. They I mean, they've come up with a different drives, you know, the Mirage drives, you got the 360 drives and that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's nice, but it doesn't really change the fundamental way, you know, the boat behaves and, um, so I was looking for something more substantial, but hasn't hasn't happened. And the other one is just a freeboard. It's very low to the water, which is good. But then the waves they hit you quite a bit, uh, and the waves clip those aqua bars all the time and give you a lot of spray. Uh, and it'd be great if they can raise those up a couple inches uh, from where they're currently designed. But uh, anyway, we got to live with what we got, you know. I was I was actually secretly hoping for for this new version of the Tandem Island. I was I wanted to wait to get it. But I thought, nah, the twenty twenty one version does not include any changes. I've heard that they 
that they have actually changed the hatch. Well, the hatches are basically the same, but they're more watertight. I don't think that's the, the bow one, but the other ones. I don't know how they would do it, and I don't even know if they, there were issues yeah, the, with those hatches. Yeah, the circular hatches uh, have always been pretty watertight from my perspective. It's the bow hatch that uh, has been a historic problem, you know, especially when in waves offshore, coastal, where the waves are breaking over the bow on every wave, you know, you're pulling in a little bit of water on each of the waves. Well, you know, you add all that up, it starts to get quite a bit of water over time. So there's been several different tricks, but nothing that's really solved it. And uh, I was hoping that they would just go to the much more rectangular type shaped hatch that would give you a bigger access to that front area and be a lot more watertight, something you can even stand on. Um, but they just haven't haven't gone through any of those changes yet. So maybe someday. But my recommendation would be just buy what you got because you can enjoy it right now. You know, there's always waiting for something new in the future until it happens. It hasn't happened anyway. That would that's, be the advice. that's the decision I've made. <laughs> Good. And they did, you're right, they did change the CE coding on there, uh, which allows for more capacity um, from a legal point of view, which sometimes, sometimes is important for the local police or something or checking about how many people you have on your boats. Uh, we mentioned the hakas. Some people put the boards across the hakas or storage space. The other thing I'm going to be experimenting with uh, is I got a stand-up paddleboard, uh, inflatable one, and I'm going to put that across the top uh, and other people could sit on that. It gets them out of the water compared to the tramps uh, and at least another you know, two or three inches higher. And it adds safety in my point of view. It's another something that floats. Somebody could hang on to that in case, uh, you know, some, you know, something fell overboard or you need something to, it's another flotation device, you know, that itself could hold 500 pounds. So, um, that's I'll be it. watching with interest on that, Jim, because with, um, the onboard, tent set up uh, often you need a way to anchor and then get to and from shore and a couple of people have sort of done something similar with stand up paddle board yeah, yeah. on youtube yeah, the, and stuff so i'm yeah. keen to look at that <laughs> yeah there's a couple of youtubes that are in that area so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be taking my uh tandem island down to uh the ten thousand islands in florida and everglades and uh, and i'm gonna be testing it out down there so in the next month or so you'll see something around that see if it's see if it works um, all right, other questions? Do you think it could catch wind? Sorry, do you think it could catch wind, uh, the board? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, you, could, you, could, uh, you could either put it right side up or upside down, and you could put a good – I'm just going to use a kayak strap to strap it to the Akas. Uh, and so I think it's, it's pretty low profile, and I don't think it will catch too much wind. I'll find out. <laughs> Okay. I use a um, I use a haka right now on one side, and yeah. um, the trampoline on the other, and it's really nice. I go out with my wife, and this is on the adventure island. That's why I've gotten the um, tandem. But anyhow, it's just three five quarter by six cedar boards, and uh, I just use a bungee cord to attach it, and then I have a stadium seat that I bungee onto it as well. So um, both of us take turns and it works out really nicely. But yeah. I always want, I'm always wondering about, you know, how that's affecting the arms. Yeah, I could tell you that I've had, uh, with the trampolines, I've actually had two adults sitting in beach chairs, one on each tramp, <laughs> plus two adults sitting in the two regular seats. So four adults. Wow. Uh, and a couple dogs uh, pushing around the, the 10,000 islands down there in Florida. So it does go a little bit lower in the water, uh, but it did fine otherwise. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it out in the waves, but for you know, the, uh, the inland waters, it worked fine. Maybe not legally, but it worked fine. <laughs> Are you saying you wouldn't do a haka in the waves? No, I'd say the... The beach chairs on the trampolines, gotcha. I, I wouldn't do in the waves. Uh, but uh, the, the hakas work well in the waves. 
I'm not sure about the beach chairs that weren't tied on in any way. They were just sitting there, <laughs> no bungees or anything. Uh, so, you know, that's where it can get interesting. All right, any other uh, questions we can go over with the group? Dirk, you have anything? In no, this is good stuff. I've got another one. No, no, I'm sorry, your turn, Dick. Uh, I've already spoken enough. No, all, all I said was that I was done. I just enjoyed everybody else's comments. So go ahead, go ahead Alejandro. Okay, um, since I am getting ready to purchase the, the tandem island, I was thinking about cars beyond the trailer. And um, I get the feeling I would go for the 230 tracks cars. Um, I know people recommend the, the dolly, but, um, but you can't really carry that with you, can you, on the, on the tandem island? Yeah, that's, that's the... Uh... There's the there's the uh, the regular tandem island cart with the two prongs that fit in the in the um, what's the technical term I'm looking for? Uh, it's a couple uh, it's a couple of holes. Couple let me holes. let me show yeah. you because my um my tandem yeah, right is there. out the window. So yeah, so I got that one right there. Those are the scup those are the beach carts, right, with the beach wheels, uh, and it fits in the scupper holes. Um, and then there's the carts that have the kind of bigger wheels than those. Uh, that kind of a dolly that fits underneath it. Uh, and that, if you had to go across a lot of sand, that would probably work a little better. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're going across rock and paved surfaces and sharp surfaces, they also make kind of a, 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 a firm tire. That's not the soft. Uh, these tires here are made for the sand. And one, one caution on these is that when you put them on, underneath for the boat, and when you're taking it off a trailer, like you see there, uh, there's a there's a bungee on the top that kind of fits to a hole to keep it from dropping down. You know, when you get it off the trailer before you hit the ground, there's like a little bungee that kind of holds the cart in place. And um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think the name of it, but anyway, it's just a bungee that kind of holds. It's like a pin, a cotter pin almost that. You pull it out of the top and you stick it through the hole in the side so it keeps it from dropping down. Um, I had a situation where I was taking it off the, off the trailer onto the sand and that bungee broke and I didn't know it. And the two sand wheels dropped down a little bit. And then when I took it off the trailer, it actually jammed and ripped out the inside of those scupper holes. Oh. And I had to do a major repair uh, to fix that. So just a caution to make sure that that little 10 cent bungee doesn't break on you to make you cause a major internal hole damage to your, to your boat. So just something to keep an eye on. Pe speaking from experience here, unfortunately. I got, um, I know those are the, the, the Hobie ones with the, either the scuppers or the one that looks like a cradle. Yeah. But I went on, I went onto the wheelie site and I actually got a, it's a, called a small boat carrier. And it, it actually, it works well with the, with the tandem island, but it, it folds up kind of like a, a V shape. It's got the larger wheels. It's got the 16 inch wheels. So it might be kind of cumbersome to take with you on the water, but for transporting either from the trailer, or I, we were using it even to go from like our driveway into our backyard or, down the beach, it, it worked well. Um, it had two straps, um, but it looks more like a like a, a sawhorse with two wheels. So you actually lift up, lift up the uh, lift up the kayak and get it on there. But then it balances pretty well. It doesn't go through the scuppers. It's got padding on the on the part where the the kayak or anything really for that matter sits. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about like damaging the scupper holes and damaging any of that. And it was. It was less than just buying the wheels by themselves. For some reason, it was on sale at on the um, wheelie site. Not to not to promote any product, but um, and it it seems to work well. It just hangs in the garage. Um, like I say, the only thing is it's got the larger, heavier tires that are rated for the weight of the the TI. So, yeah, that sounds good. I, I'm and having so trouble with the inflatable, the, the inflatable wheels, like unless you're using it on like completely soft, fluffy sand, like it's just, yeah. I can't get the 
pressures right and everything. I've also got these, um, I haven't yet tried these, but I've got about six of these. They're like a firm um, foam-based tire, I think, which can interchange with the um, beach cart. But yeah, it, it's a good point about the scupper holes. I, I'm always very nervous with uh, lowering yeah. the boat down when, and, and it's hard to get the wheels on and off. So I've actually got like, there's a, you can do a um, bungee cord uh, modification to them where you can feed through the um, this cord. I'll, I'll try to post a um, YouTube link on it, but it's a really good cheap mod to enable you like a single person to lift the boat and it springs the wheels into place as well. So that has been quite handy for me. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Uh, and then the other thing, I'm, as I showed in, when I did the walk around on the TI, uh, I use that roller, you know, just a roller, underneath the bow and it gets me you know most of the way out of the water when i pull it up on a beach uh it's not meant for transport it's just meant for that first three to four feet to get the boat out of the water and, and it doesn't get in the way while you're sailing so i found that quite useful and it's now a permanent uh, fixture to my boat um for that for that use all right uh, other questions all right well let's uh call it a, a morning and night and evening wherever you may be i want to thank everyone for uh, joining and again this was just a fun talk among some uh, some hobie sailors uh, to share some ideas hopefully you got something out of it uh, we will post this up on the forum on youtube uh, in the next uh, few days and if there's enough interest uh, maybe we'll do another one sometime in the summertime uh, and maybe uh, you guys can add some more stories to to your adventure so the main thing Keep sailing, keep having fun, do it safely, and uh, enjoy your uh, your Hobie, Hobie Islands. And thank you, Jim. Yep. Thank, thank you, you very Thomas, much, everybody. Thanks for organizing this. Yeah, special thanks, Jim, for coordinating everyone and organizing this. Yeah, it's really invaluable. No, let's do it. one a month. <laughs> I'd like to do that. Just yeah, I don't know. Progress. I got some other activities that are keeping me from doing it once a month, but hey, I'd be oh, I'd be willing to join in one. But I'll, I'll host a couple a year. But that's probably the most I can do. Okay. But and for the guys on the East Coast, if you guys want to meet up somewhere to do a sale, uh, we can also uh, arrange for that. I'll try and post some things on the Hopi forum um, uh, if you want to try and meet up somewhere. And we are trying to get a, a small group together to do a sale in Chesapeake Bay around the Annapolis, the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, and then uh, just we're going to plan some maybe larger sales around that area. So keep an eye out open for that. Just a, you, just a quick um, resource as well. The I found this on Facebook only recently, the Hobie Adventure and Tandem Island Owners Group. It's got two and a half thousand members and there's a lot of like, it's not as organized as the forum, but there's a lot of like, knowledge and resources on there in case anyone didn't know about that too. Um, yeah. Good. Now that's a good point. And certainly that and the Hobie Forum was a, a, really a rich wealth of knowledge there that you can tap into. So uh, that's where I got most of my ideas. So it's, I, you know, I'm just sharing other people's ideas. So that's, I would certainly recommend to go there. All right, guys, we'll okay. say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, nice to guys. meet you. And I'll try Until to find time. you again. Till next time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Now we got to find the end button. All right. Bye, everyone.